Game over! Now you might be wondering what exactly is the Nintendo effect? Well, the Nintendo effect is when, for no real reason that makes much sense, the design of your game stops certain types of players from having fun. Basically, the Nintendo effect is putting unnecessary restrictions on gameplay and player choice. You might also consider it how you fuck up the easy part. That last little bit that'll help all the different types of players have as much fun as possible with the game. I'm not talking about any glaring design issues that impact the gameplay experience overall for everyone. I'm talking about little things that mess up the game for you if you want to play it a certain way. So if you play it the right way, you won't notice. If you play it the wrong way, have fun trying to have fun. When Mario Maker came out, I was so pumped. It was the reason why I got a Wii U. I mean, sure, there was other games I wanted to play, but that was the main reason. The idea of making your own Mario levels and sharing them with people was just incredible. And then on top of that, I was going to be able to play other people's, play my friends, play random courses, whatever. It was going to be a blast. So I'm building courses. I'm having a great time doing that. But I quickly realized that I wasn't that good at it. So I wanted to find some inspiration online. I wanted to play some other courses. The way I wanted to do this was that I wanted to do the 100 Mario Challenge, which in case you don't know, is where you go through random stages in that game that other creators have made with 100 lives. You try to make it to the end. Sounds like fun, and it should be. Except that, uh, sometimes people like to just make horrible levels. You walk through a door, boom, spike pit. Another one, try to get through the door, haha, <laughs> there's just 100 of them and you have to hope you get through the right one, too bad. These autoplay levels that admittedly were cool at first, but when they overtook everything else, I, I, I didn't want to play them at all. I didn't want to. Just hard levels that aren't fun in the slightest, totally unenjoyable. All the BS deaths and levels I didn't want to play quickly made me realize something. This wasn't going to be that fun. So I just went back to making courses again, and yeah, I enjoyed the game. Yes, I enjoyed sometimes going on and just clicking random levels and looking at the top creators doing that sort of thing. But the fact of the matter was that my enjoyment of that game was kneecapped by this one weird design decision, which was to have no way that the game really sorts through in that 100 Mario challenge the good or the bad. I was just getting fed crap, and at the end of the day, I just left it feeling like I would rather play an actual Mario game made by Nintendo. I didn't realize it at the time, but the specific way I was playing the game, it wasn't the way you were supposed to play the game if you wanted to have fun. This guy Steve goes into it in a really good video, so I'm not going to belabor the point by describing everything he goes through. But basically, in the first Super Mario Maker, the people who played that challenge mode, any of those ones where you got random levels, were sorting through the crap and the good stuff for everyone else. They would like it at the end, or not like it, and based on what happened in that mode, it would either get rolled out to other people in other ways, get recommended through the recommendation system, or it wouldn't. And I had no way of knowing this. So in the end, I just put down the game, played it for about 20 hours, had some fun with it. But what had been a super anticipated game became just, you know, pretty good. And it would have been a lot better if I was a different type of player, but because I wasn't, too bad for me. This wouldn't matter that much if it was just one isolated incident of the first Super Mario Maker, but it's not. Super Mario Maker 2 has this weird problem with it. They went in the other direction, where now, instead of people like me who are playing it that way by playing through the random Mario levels getting screwed, it's all these other people making the levels getting screwed. Seed goes into it in his video here too. Basically, there's just a very low chance that your level is going to be seen by anyone at all. You'll put it up, it'll fall into the abyss, and no one's ever going to see it. That tends to be happening to people. Which is a problem, but honestly, I don't want to comment on it too much because I haven't bought the game. Because I wasn't willing to dish out another 80 Canadian bones after the first one disappointed me. I will admit though, I heard one thing about Super Mario Maker 2 that had me excited around launch time. And it might have got me to buy it. Which was that it was going to have online multiplayer. And I thought that running through co-op levels or special competitive levels with my brother online would be awesome. This was exactly what I would want to do in that game. But fortunately for me, I didn't buy it right away despite the great reviews, because unfortunately there was this weird thing where you just couldn't play online with your friends at the start. You could only play online with random people, and even then I've heard that it was awful, but you couldn't play with your friends at the start. And again, a specific type of player just gets screwed. 
There's no good reason for it. It should be easy to do, but you're screwed. Uh, but you know, they rolled it out in October, a few months after the game came out. Sometimes you can wait and Nintendo might fix it. You know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing that they fixed it. I'll give them that. But there's a whole lot of other examples of this where they haven't fixed it. Now, Splatoon on the Wii U. Great multiplayer game. I was having loads of fun with that. And then I unlock ranked mode. I'm ready to play all the different modes. I'm ready to play splat zones, tower control, rainmaker, all that stuff. But then there was this weird thing where I was, I went on and I couldn't really choose anything. It was just one game mode up there and two maps. So, you know, I had fun playing it, but it was kind of weird, right? I'd go on and say, you know, I feel like playing tower control today, but I don't get a choice because every two hours this thing cycles through and it's the same in Splatoon 2. It cycles through the maps and the modes. So sometimes you'll log on and see the game mode that you want to play and you go, oh good, I'm lucky, I get to play the mode I want to play. Or I guess that you can go and look online to see what the schedule is. But let's face it, a lot of the time, we don't want to look at a schedule for a video game. We want to be able to turn it on and play the mode we want to play. But no, you turn it on, it's the mode you want to play. You go to play it. Oh, you play it for 10 minutes? Too bad, we're going to a different game mode, we're putting up maps. What if you don't like the maps? Too bad. If you don't like the game mode? Too bad. You're a sucker. You paid for this. Congratulations. Now, admittedly, I'm a person who doesn't mind any of these modes. I like all of them. I had a ton of fun playing any of them that popped up, and I really didn't mind the rotation system. But the fact of the matter is that this design ruins the game for a big chunk of players who just want to play their way. They just want to play one of the modes. They don't want to engage with all this other stuff. They shouldn't need to. They bought the game. Let them have fun the way they want to have fun. Super Mario Party, that's an easy one. I could complain about a lot of stuff with this game, but there's one big thing I'd say as part of the Nintendo effect. The main one's comical, because if you want to go online, you better enjoy playing about 10 mini games. I think that's how many there are. 10 mini games. If there is at least a good mini game mode on there, you know, something like the Mario Party 5 one where you fill in the board when you win, that was pretty fun. Then I guess you could at least have some fun with it, but this way, why on earth would anyone want to play this? And why can't we just play the parties online? I get that it won't be as good as if you're in person and that there might be an issue with people quitting, but that's an issue that exists in a lot of games and people still play them online, both with randoms and with friends. Why not? Especially with friends, I mean, just save it after every turn. If something goes wrong, you go back to it, have some fun, but no, you don't get to enjoy the game even though it should be so simple to implement this. So simple compared to the loads of work that went into making this game look aesthetically good, to designing the levels, to doing all this other stuff, and the same goes for Splatoon 2. If you thought any of this was bad, then uh, I'm sorry to say, but it gets worse, and we're moving on to Pokemon, and I'm not going to go into this whole Dexit thing, not going to go into how the game looks. I'm just going to talk about this Pokemon Home thing. So I learned from looking up stuff for this, that there's Pokemon Bank on the 3DS. And that had an annual fee of $4.99 US. I thought that was already kind of weird that you would have to pay to store them in this thing. But now they have this different thing, Pokemon Home on your smartphone. This bad boy costs $2.99 per month, $4.99 for three months, or $15.99 per year. Just to have your Pokemon stored? Really? Regardless of what anyone's going to say about the whole Dexit stuff, I think everyone would agree that the central conceit of the series is that you're catching these guys, collecting them, and that you get to keep them. And that's something really special about the series is that throughout all these games, you can keep your guys. But in the same game where they cut out a bunch of them, they go, hey, by the way now, have fun trying to keep these guys. Because it's going to cost you $2.99 for a month, $4.99 for three months, or, you know, we'll be really nice and give you the low, low price of $15.99 per year if you're willing to commit to that. This extra thing, this extra cost. It's just a fuck you to the player. Fuck you for thinking that these guys were ever yours at all. Just like how we're going to make you rebuy every game for every Nintendo console you have, and then we're going to sell them to you through a subscription service instead of letting you buy them. We're going to make you do it with these guys too. And we haven't even got to what I think is the worst one.
There are so many different types of Animal Crossing players, and yet Animal Crossing New Horizons manages to improve upon the virtual lives of each player type that I can think of. Regardless of how you play and experience the title, it has an incredibly sharp eye for detail. I have a personal sense of ownership and pride in my island, and I'm thrilled to show it off and visit my friends too. The only major limitations besides your wallet is your imagination and whether you're willing to put the time in to make it a reality. This one's fresh. This one's recent. People like it a lot, and I can see why. It's a very charming game. It looks great. It feels nice to play. I've had a decent amount of fun with it. But now I'm one of these special people who is in the situation where I want to play it with somebody else on the same console. I want to play it with my fiance. And I had already heard about the one island restriction, which is ridiculous. But one island, for us, that was fine. So I still bought it. Little did I know, though, that by booting up the game first, I was the island representative. That now I was making all the decisions, even though I knew that she would enjoy the game more and I would rather have her have those decisions. I went in. So now if she wants to progress because I'm not playing as much, she's got to log into my account, do stuff like collect items and use them to build buildings. And then she can go back to her file and continue playing. And the game is so blatant about how anybody who starts after the first player is just chopped liver. Eh, who cares about these guys? So my fiance logs on second. She gets dropped into the town. And since she went in pretty close to after me, there wasn't any immediate problems. But things started popping up. When Nook's cranny needed to be built, they told me all these items they needed. And I told her about them. So she went and she collected them on her own account after she logged on. She collected everything. And she went to go pay for this and they wouldn't accept the items from her. So she had to send me the items she had collected through presents, then I had to go on, and then I had to go pay for it, and they say, thanks man, you're great, you did all this for us, bless ya. But she did it. Which, by the way, goes against the game's central conceit, its basic design. Now the game begins, and you have less than you've ever had in any other Animal Crossing game. And the game is slow because of that, it takes a long time to get much of anything. But the idea for that, in my opinion, is that the creators of the game wanted you to feel like everything on the island is yours, like you have earned it and you were a part of making it what it is. So when another player doesn't get credit for doing that stuff, or when they have to jump through these weird hoops to get it done, that breaks down the basic idea of what makes this game special. Because this island isn't yours at all. You aren't even really sharing it. You have to do what player one wants. Otherwise, you don't get to have fun. So, you know, this is suboptimal at this point, this whole because I logged in first thing. But you know what would be a good way to at least start getting around that? If she could start her own island. And now people defend this, and I actually understand why. Because uh, from a game design perspective, I'm sure that you had a boardroom meeting and everyone was sitting around at Nintendo and they were going over what would be the best way to play the game. Not necessarily what seems the best from the outside, but once you're in the game, what is the best from a game design perspective? And Reggie probably walked in there and he said to them, listen guys, I have this idea. What if player two got fucked? Now, perhaps the most infuriating part of this one again is that people defend it. And I know that a lot of people don't, but there's still a pretty decent amount of people defending this. And there's one big argument that really pisses me off, which is it's always been like this. There are two main issues with this argument. First, why does it matter if it's always been like this? Just because something has been like that before, it doesn't mean you're going to want to keep doing it. So I guess we never should have progressed past 8-bit graphics, and we never should have done anything that might break the mold of what games have previously done. You know, progress is bad. The second part of the argument is it's the game design. This is how the game was always meant to be played. You were meant to be stuck on the same island together, and you're supposed to like trade for resources, and communicate with each other, and have fun playing that way. And I don't know what sort of perfect happy families everyone has that they can't even fathom that some people don't want to do that, but the fact of the matter is some people don't want to do that. And if that's really the way the game's meant to be played, then I guess I'm sorry that you live alone and you don't get to play the game as intended, if you do live alone. Besides, it's not even true, because the issue with this well, there's a bunch of issues, but one of the biggest parts of the issue is that there's no real way around this outside of buying another Switch. With the GameCube one, you just needed enough room on the memory card to make another save file. 
and it came with a memory card. So you'd pop that one in, you'd do it. If you needed another save file, you'd go get another memory card and use that one. That's exactly what we did when I was a kid with the GameCube Animal Crossing. With Wild World, you just needed a different game cartridge, which yeah, that's expensive and still kind of dumb. Maybe there was actually some sort of memory limitation on the card. I don't know. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt with that one. Because also, if someone else wanted a copy, like my brother did when we both had towns and to visit them, you could buy another game card. 40 bucks Canadian at the time that game was out. So, you know, it's always been this way, but now instead of spending $40, you're going to have to spend about 500 Then with uh, New Leaf, again, you just have to buy a different game card. With the Wii one, I don't know how the Wii one worked, I never played that one. What's really crazy about this is that no review prepared me for this. I watched a bunch of reviews to make sure. IGN, Nintendo Life, Commonwealth Realm, Game Explain. There's four reviews, more than the average person is probably going to watch leading up to a game. None of them mention, in any way, this whole second player issue. And by issue, I mean where if they go on second, they aren't the island representative and they can't do a bunch of stuff. And their progress is obstructed by player one. That's what I'm talking about. None of them mention this. Too bad for us, I guess. Here's the thing with this Animal Crossing thing, too. Even if they update it, it's kind of too late. Because a whole bunch of people already went out there and they bought new Switches to play it on. And now, in part, that's kind of their thing. I don't know why they're doing that. That's a lot of money to spend. I guess if you have the money to blow, go for it, but I would never do that personally. Maybe I'm being a bit too negative here, but I think it's ridiculous to see this as anything other than a money grab. We all hate microtransactions. Well, this is a macro transaction. You bought the game, but other people can't play it the way you can play it because they logged on second. So buy another console, sucker. Now, I know people are going to want to defend Nintendo. It's like a part of their identity or something, but hear me out. Okay, well you already did, but continue to hear me out. I'm only pissed off about this, because I like these games too. I bought all this shit. I want to like it, I try to like it, and for the most part I do like it. But there are these little nagging design areas where Nintendo says we know way better than you. We know so much better, you don't want to play it that way, you want to play it this way. And because why wouldn't you? We know how the game works, you don't. Even though, in all these cases I've listed, there is no negative I can think of for just letting the player have some freedom. Letting them play a little more the way they want to play. I don't see why this gets brushed under the rug by reviewers. I don't see why this is just, hey, it's a Nintendo thing. So maybe the real Nintendo effect is that no matter what Nintendo does, no matter how stupid their decisions get, no matter how much they rip us off, we'll just keep buying it.